Some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now he couldn't have chosen two common groups of people in his day more opposed to each other than this. The Pharisee is the one that is hanging on, the guardian of the Jewish culture and the Jewish religion. They are fighting against the influences of Rome and all that Rome brings. The tax collector is the sellout to the Jewish nation, the one who embraces the Roman way. And he says against these two folks, the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. You know, whenever we're gonna compare ourselves, we're always gonna pick the worst of the bunch to compare ourselves to. And this is pretty much the worst of the bunch. Almost everybody's gonna come out pretty good on this one. He says, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. Two practices that are supposed to remain private that he's making public and bragging about. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He won't even come into the inner court area for the Jews. He's staying out in the outer area where women and foreigners would have stayed. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified. Justified is this right in the eyes of God. For everyone, listen to this, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Father, we want to properly understand what you want to teach us about humility and pride that we might be exalted by you and not humbled by you. Would you give us understanding? Would you break through this tough area for us? Would you open our minds and ears, soften our hearts, that your teaching, your word might have its intended result in our souls. Thank you for the people who came early and set these chairs in rows. Thank you for the folks that are over keeping kids right now that we might enjoy this quiet. Working with junior hires across in the gym. Loving them. Caring for them. And thank you for our time together. Use it for our good, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Tough assignment tonight. It's gonna to be tough on us. Uh, it's tough prep for me. It's gonna to be tough for you to hear. It's humanity's biggest problem. And I'll tell you historically why I think that, but humanity's biggest problem is pride. Now, as we define pride, we're gonna define it as thinking of oneself too much and not thinking about God very much at all. Now, so it's, it's not the kind of thought, it's the amount of thought. Let me, give you, let me tell you a story um, that maybe will kind of show you what I'm trying to talk about. A, a person came up to me this past week, very strange, very strange thing, and he came up to me and he said, Steve, you're the only guy I know that puts his thumbs in his pockets. <laughs> and I was like, what? Is that strange? And now maybe it is, maybe I am, but that's just a strange thing to say. He didn't know me that well. <laughs> now, and I got to tell you, my inner reaction was, this is my inner reaction. Yes, yeah, so what? <laughs> 
And lots of you are like that with me. You are, you're, you're like this. You, you, your response is to kind of move towards it. And, and you're easily ad- identified with pride, this being one of the things that's in your life because you're loud, you're boisterous, you're confrontive, you're combative. But there are some of you in the room that if this person would have said that to you, you would have gone. But here's the deal. What are you thinking? Don't put my thumbs in. Don't put my thumbs in. Don't put my thumbs in. Don't put your thumbs in. Don't keep right here, right? Stay still. Don't put your thumbs in. Where's your thought? All about you. It's thinking whether you're loud and boisterous or quiet and gentle. How much thought are you giving to yourself? How, what percentage? Did you notice that when the Pharisee prayed, he prayed about himself? How much energy? What are you doing there? In the classic work, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote this. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine they are guilty themselves. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. The more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. If C.S. Lewis is half right, All of us have this. Most of us don't know we have it. We see it in others. And the more we dislike it in others, the more we have it. It's it's this pride, is is, is this sneak attack that comes in and sneaks up on us and can wreck our souls. It's a big deal. Let me trace it through the scriptures for you just in broad strokes. It's the founding sin of Satan and why he fell. It's the sin of the fallen angels. It's the primary temptation of the Garden of Eden. It's the sin of the Tower of Babel. It's the single strategy to tempt Jesus in the desert. It's the root cause of every single war and every conflict. And the chief reason for most human misery. You you take the toxic behaviors of hatred, bigotry, violence, and selfishness, and pride is right at the root of all four. This is a big deal. It's a big deal among us. And we are mostly unaware of it. Except for some of the boisterous combative personalities here. Most of us run through our life unaware of just how much culture is squeezing us into this uh, self-focused thought process. Let me show you how this happens. Now, uh, I'm gonna lay out using the narrative of the scriptures, kind of the beginning of mankind to now and even to glory. And it kind of looks like this, that the story would unfold like this. There's an Eden. And for our purposes, we understand what that means. That's, you know, that's... uh, you know, at the, when nothing was goofed up, we've got the Eden, and then from there it goes, stuff gets goofed up, the fall, salvation, holiness, discipleship, and heaven. And you just work through, that's the broad narrative of the story of Scripture as you work your way through it. But now let me talk to you about how, and most of the time, people will talk about their worldview how they see the world unfolding and their part in it, they will use these same narrative terms even though they come from the scriptures, even though they're not Christians. They might not use these same terms, but they use that same storyline. There are some who would say they are atheists and there's a completely naturalistic or humanistic view towards mankind, but from a global perspective, that is very few of us. Most of us do not believe that we are just a product of time and space and chance and chemical reactions that are going on in this body of ours. And then we retreat down to the dirt and we just push up daisies from there. Most people do not live that way. They believe that that there's a narrative, things have happened. But that doesn't mean that necessarily God's in the center of it. So as as you look at this, the way it kind of unfolds is that when Eden comes along in the story of Eden, this culture would say that, that This is the unspoiled inner child. 
This was a time when we were born innocent and happy and whole. Scriptures would call this the pre-fall and the being in the presence of God with human beings and God in the same in presence without sin. This is what, how it was before things got goofed up. And then as, our, as we interact with culture and the narrative that we hear, the fall or how things got goofed up, basically there was trauma. Bad stuff started happening, bad family experiences. We had a loss of, restri- of innocence, restrictions of our pursuit of happiness, and our, we developed low self-esteem. And that's when things got goofed up, when we started not recognizing our inner self. Scriptures would say, no, it simply got goofed up when we rebelled against a holy God and the loving rule of him. How do you get good? How does salvation happen? How do you become good? Well, the culture would say, find yourself and find happiness in someone or something. Now, and at this point, if it's an Eastern religion, then it would just cycle back. If you, depending on how well you've done, if you've done really well, then you get to move, jump to the final thing of heaven. But if you haven't done well, well, you just cycle back up to the top again and you just kind of start working your way through two, two or three steps, trying it over and over in reincarnation. Christianity's worldview would say, no, salvation is not found in finding yourself. It's actually found in dying to yourself and embracing the offer of Christ on Calvary's cross and having hope for life after death because of his resurrection. How do you go about the process of of becoming holy? It's to, to get and live in such a way where you have a freedom from all external commitments. And we live in a culture where you're, you're supposed to be free from those kinds of things. And you would, those kinds of commitments are only going to tie you up and they're going to keep you from happiness. Christianity would say no holiness would, be, would come through a relationship with God through Jesus. How do you live the good life? How do you do discipleship? If we were using a Christian term, well, you pursue happiness. You focus on your inner self. You escape the binding commitments. That's what culture would tell you. You deserve the breaks. Go and get them. Pursue them. Christianity would say, no, practice the way of Jesus with the help of the Spirit's power and the, and, and the help of community around you, but practice the way of Jesus. And then heaven would be, from our culture's perspective, heaven would be pleasure and happiness without any kind of restraint. You've rediscovered your inner child. You have set yourself free and happiness is now pursued without boundaries. Christianity would say, no, it's, it's a new creation and a new earth with Jesus as king and we're not the center of it all, Jesus is. And you can see how just, if, if this is the narrative. Now this may not help you much, but it helps me a lot as I kind of listen to what, we're, what is coming our way all of the time. It's, is the self the center of our existence or is someone else? And basically our culture would say, center it on yourself, pursue the happiness that would deal. Do not allow the world to put you in bondage, bondage or any kinds of commitments there that would hamper happiness. Be true to yourself, center on yourself. And Jesus would say, no, die to yourself and find life. These are diametrically opposed men and women. Now, here's what I'd like to tell you. The column on the left side, if you could just throw it up real quick again. The column on the left side is failing. Anxiety, isolation, burden of relationships, commitment phobias, Breakdown of the family, identity confusion. Basically, people want progress and education and all that stuff's gonna happen, but they want all of the progress towards happiness without the presence of God. They want the kingdom without the king. So did you, and so do I, before I came to Jesus. But those of us in Jesus, we recognize that the real power is in the presence of God. And in order for us to have kingdom life, somebody's got to be king, and it ain't us. And so this left column is failing, and we're isolated and more divided than we have ever been, possibly. Now, pride shows up in all kinds of different ways. There's so, social climbing and the judgment of other people and what's in it for me and I want this thing and 
an unwillingness to be treated by a servant. By the way, that's a big one for me. I actually like serving as long as someone sees me serve and notices it. But better not treat me like a servant. I may not, I better, if I'm over there picking something up and you walk by and say, hey, would you pick that up too? Whoo. And that's just a true test. That what, why, why am I, why, he's just helping me see what I'm, to get it done. Why would I be against that? Because I'm not there to serve. I'm there for you to notice me serving. Making decisions without involving God at all. Lots of anxiety and worry. Pride shows up by building your own, your own kingdom. Now, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take you to two passages, two great passages, famous box top passages, and talk about how do we combat pride. One is going to talk about how we are involved in, in, what, in what Christ commands us to do, and then one's going to show us the example of Christ. So Romans chapter 12 begins with this statement. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. And it, the, the book of Romans really plays out in such a way that this therefore is a literary marker for us to understand that he's begun a new chapter, a new thought process in this. In the first three cha chapters of the book of Romans, he basically has talked about the universal condemnation of all mankind, that all are, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then at the end of chapter three and chapters four and five, it basically offers this free gift of Jesus Christ to all who believe. Everybody needs it because all have sinned and it's offered to all freely by faith in Jesus. The work of Christ is complete and finished and if you embrace it by faith, salvation is yours. And then in chapters six, seven, and eight, it begins to talk about the assurance of that faith, that you are now God's child and that nothing can separate you from God's love. And then what Paul says now, in light of this, this great need that we have, that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, that we have all that we need provided in Jesus Christ, and it is absolutely assured to us if we simply respond by faith that we are eternally secure in him. In light of that, I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, the idea of offering your bodies in this, in this tense of the verb that is a definite time in, in history that's gonna have ongoing results, but it happens right here. You offer your body as a, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is, in light of all that Jesus has done, a reasonable act of worship. Do not conform to the patterns, to the worldviews, to the messages that you hear from this world. One translation says, don't allow it to squeeze you into its mold. But be changed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and perfect will. And then he says this, for by the grace given me, I say to all of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but think of yourselves with sober or sound or correct judgment in accordance to the measure of faith God has given you. And, and right there, Paul does this little play on words. You don't see it in the English, but he actually uses the word for think four times almost in a row with different prefixes saying, when you think, don't overthink. But think, and then think accurately. It's just, he just stacks it on top of each other so that you can begin to see that. Do not be proud. He doesn't say, don't think of yourselves at all. He doesn't say, have no thought of yourself. Empty yourself of all thoughts of you. No, just to think of yourself accurately. Now how? In accordance to the measure of faith God has given you. And then it goes on to say in verse four, just as each of us has one body with many, many members, uh, we have one body and many members. We have feet, we have legs, we have, we have noses, we have ears, we have fingers. And those members, the feet and the hands don't have the same function. They all have different tasks to do. 
So in Christ, we are, who are many form one body. So what is he saying? He's saying, when you think about yourself, think accurately to understand what part you play in the body. Not everybody can be hands. And for you to be a foot and spend your whole time thinking about yourself when you're ticked because you ain't a hand is not only not thinking about yourself accurately, it's thinking about yourself too much. It's overthinking about yourself. And then each member belongs to all the others. The, the command about this proper understanding is, is not that we try to eliminate all thought of ourselves. It's not that at all. It's just to not overthink of yourselves, to not place yourself at the center of all that goes on. To have other pronouns that you use besides me, I, mine. This kind of tells us, okay, this is the command of it. Now, the example of it is in Philippians chapter two, another tremendous passage. Because of the work of Christ, here's the example of Christ. He goes in first and he gives a, a, a set of first class conditions to explaining something. It's if then statements. If, and the first class condition is if, and he's saying if, but it's assumed to be true. And we use these all the time. We actually use them in our English language. We have these little slang kind of first class conditions like um, is King Kong a monkey? Well, of course he is. Godzilla lizard? Sure. Pope Catholic? Absolutely. Steve Bald? Sure. <laughs> right? We do these. And that's what he's doing here. He's saying, I'm gonna give you some first class conditions and here they go. If there's any encouragement from being united with Christ, and of course there is. If there's any comfort from their love, of course. Any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, yes, yes, yes. Then, if that's all true and it is, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Did you notice that when they gave the command of how to think about ourselves accurately in Romans, it says because we're one body and each member belongs to all the others. And here when he gives to be, starts to get ready to tell us about the example of Christ, again it says one, one mind, one spirit, one purpose. And in the command, do, not, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, in other words, it's, it, it, but also to the interests of others. It doesn't say you shouldn't look to your interests at all. Of course you should, but don't, not just your own. You should also have a, a margin in there where you could look out for the interests of others. And then your, verse five starts this, the, one of the, the oldest Christian hymn we have. It is, most biblical scholars believe that what then Paul does at verse five is he starts when he says, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. That is the beginning of a quote of a hymn they sang in the first century about Jesus. One of the very first written, we've, we've been reading it ever since. It's called Carmen Christi. A hymn of Christ. And here's what it says. Jesus's example is. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Left all the glory of heaven and made himself, subjected himself to time and sleep, the need for food, of being tired, of being let down by friends. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a slave. being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That the life that we're trying to walk after Christ is not this some exalted, everything works, everything's gonna go great, it's always gonna be happy and, and, and provisions. Some of those things will happen and they will happen sometimes in, in, in amazing ways. 
But the lifestyle that we commit to is that we will humble ourselves and become obedient. And because God did that, verse nine, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every single name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth. And every single tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The example that Christ laid out for us is one of humility, is one of taking ourself off of the throne and the ambitions of our lives. Our lives, our, our, our desires become so disordered and very subtly we find ourselves in the very position that we detest. This past week, I had a great morning prepping for pride. I'm in the scriptures. I'm in two of my favorite passages. I'm laying the message out. I'm learning this kind of thing. And then after doing that for a while, I turn and I open email. And as I open an email, I read of a church that is celebrating what God did for them in the past year. Now, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I just want to show you how subtle it comes in. My reaction to that email was, as they claimed all of their um, things that they were celebrating, my first reaction was, you lie. You're not that good. You're not as good as us. Now, I just... Again, I just got out of the scriptures talking about pride. Now, I just got to believe, maybe not, but I just got to believe if I'm susceptible to this, you are. And I wrote in my journal in capital letters, you are a hypocrite. Steve Clifford. You know how ugly it is when I give my life to God's church and God chooses to do something in a church and I essentially cuss it? So I want to I wanna give you two applications to come from this, to go out of this. And there's gonna be some help for this first one on the app. I wanna expose you to a spiritual practice that's, that's over 500 years old called the examine. And the examine has five steps to it. They're quite simple, really. The first one is to ask God for light. And to ask God for light is really inviting God into the conversation. It can be done in morning, lunch, night, and you just say simply, God, I'm, I'm pausing. I'd like to hear from you. Thank you for being available to me. I come in the name of Christ and on his merit. And I give thanks. I thank you for the things that bless you. I give thanks for the things that have happened over the last 24 hours or since the last time I've done this examine. I give you thanks. And, and you may say, well, there's nothing really anything to, think of, to be thankful for. Just, just slow down. Slow down, hot rod. Think about it. You're breathing. There's something. Just don't, be, don't make stuff up. It's what comes to your mind. And then just review the day. Look over the day. The past 24 hours or since you've done examining the time before, what has happened? What kinds of things have been going on? The disappointments and the, and the joys, the, the relational tensions and the, and the things that have brought real happiness. Just review them. 
And then as you review them, some things might come up like it came up for me. And rather than just dismiss it and not face it because your pursuit's all happiness and you don't want to have all them negative thoughts, instead get involved in one of the most important disciplines of the Christian life. Face your shortcomings and do two things. One, confess. Confession is simply agreeing with God about what he said you did. That's all it is. In my own mind, God in, in, in his grace made me aware of my attitude towards this place, this other church. And I agreed God, for someone who says that they believe what they believe, why would I ever react that way? And I just started to do introspection. I agree with you, God. It's wrong. I am sorry for it. I confess and then I repent. Confession, repentance. Repentance is to turn away from it. God, I don't want to think that way about people that are doing the same work for you that I do. I want to be able to rejoice in their victories. I don't want to measure successes and by the comparisons of people that are around here doing the same kinds of things I'm doing. I want to rejoice in those kinds of things. Help me to turn from those things. I confess and I repent. And then I look toward the day to come. For me, that looks like I open up Google Calendar and I look through the appointments of the day. Some of them I'm looking forward to and I thank God for the opportunity and that I will be effective in encouraging whoever I'm meeting with. Some of them I might even pray that they cancel. <laughs> but if they do come, God, then give me wisdom and patience to be able to be able to speak what you want them to hear for them. And I just lay out my day and I commit it to him and then I go. I'm asking you, I'm challenging you to just over this next week, you can use the app. It'll walk you through this examine. It'll have something there for you. Ask God for light, give thanks, review the day, face your shortcomings, and then look toward the day to come. Try to do it. If you've never done it before, try to do it once or twice in the coming week. Once or twice. If this, if this is a part of maybe what you do every once in a while, maybe you try to do it four or five times this coming week. This process will bring correct thinking about yourself and a humility that pleases God. The second thing I'd like to challenge you to do is to actively seek opportunities in the coming week to humble yourself for the benefit of others. And if you get any, if people notice it and you get credit for it, it doesn't count. Just find some way, just ask God, say, I don't have to make anything up. You're gonna see some things. Things will come up, just opportunities for you to serve. Paper on the floor, that's not your job to pick up that paper. Pick this, you just pick it up and put it in the trash. Maybe it's, it's not your chore to make sure that the dog gets fed, but you feed the dog. Not your week to scoop the poop. But you scoop the poop. But if you scoop the poop and then you go in the house and say, I scoop the poop, doesn't count. Look for an opportunity to humble yourselves for the benefit of others in the coming week. One last quote from Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis. Whenever we find that our religious life is making us feel that we are good, above all, that we are better than someone else, that's what happened to me. I think we may be sure that we are being acted on, not by God, but by the devil himself. If your practice of your faith is helping you to feel good in such a way that you look down on other people. 
That is not the movement of the Spirit of Christ. You are being pursued by someone who seeks to devour your soul. I'm reminded, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Reading through the great offer of Christ in Philippians 2 and his example for us, it would be wrong to rush past this moment and not give you an opportunity if you are here and as you heard of the example of Christ, as you recognize his willingness to suffer and die for you, the offer of salvation to all who would believe, If you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus and you'd like to, I wanna give you an opportunity. Just raise your hand that I could pray for you. Is there anybody here that would wanna do that? Yeah, thanks, man. Let's see it. Yeah. All right. Father, thank you. Thank you for your spirit moving among us in such a way that eyes are open to the love and salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the affirmation from your word that promises that as we embrace Jesus in faith, we are declared righteous and made your child. A son or a daughter of the King of Kings forever in your hands. Thank you for the faith, the brand new faith that we experienced here tonight. Establish them. Establish them in Jesus. May they know with certainty your love. Give them faith. And God, I pray for everyone here, anyone watching on a video stream, that you would move in such a way that you would give us opportunities to practice the exam in this coming week. We would invite you into the journey and we would examine our lives under your scrutiny. And that you would have your way, that we would hear your voice, that you would provide opportunities for us to serve and that we would do it in secret, without credit, for your glory. And that you would form a humility in us that allows us to be exalted at the proper time by you and you alone. (laughs) Thanks for loving us. Thanks for putting up with us, forgiving us. Thank you for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.